We'll ask the same game question here. Let's read it again, and let's pay attention now to the structure of this poem. The poem again titled, This is Just to Say. We'll get to the title, by the way, in a sec, right? I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. All right, so jot down a couple of things really quickly. For example, how many stanzas are in this poem? Okay, see that one, right? You've got a certain number of lines in the first stanza, a certain number of lines in the second stanza. Significantly, we want to point this out in our notes, notice the spacing between the word breakfast and forgive. Did you see that? Also, notice that there's only two words capitalized in this poem. Did you see this? The first word of the first stanza, I, and the second uh, stanza's first word, forgive. Question, why is the second stanza's word, forgive, capitalized? And often the answer will be, so that the reader understands that this is the second part of the poem. Now, some poems have an importance for their title. Some, not so much. The Red Wheelbarrow could be read without that title, The Red Wheelbarrow. Would you agree with me? I mean, you just read that poem and you can know this is a poem where he's going to talk about red wheelbarrows and chickens, and it's kind of an important distinction to be made. Right? But you could read the poem without the title. However, this poem requires its title. So let's analyze it. This is just to say... Now this is a pronoun, right, that refers to something called its antecedent, the thing it refers to. In other words, let's play the game this way. This what is just to say? How do you answer that question? This what? Yeah, and our normal answer would be this poem. Although, if you saw it this way, you wouldn't call this a poem. What would you call this? What would you call this? Probably a note, right? It might just be a note that, for example, scribbled on a postum sticker and stuck where? Stuck where, do you imagine? Where would this note be stuck? You're right, on the icebox uh, uh, door, right? That is to say, um, she, you know, whoever's looking for it opens up the icebox like, dude, where are those? Ugh, the plums are gone. And then see the note and go, oh. In other words, this note, poem, is just to say. Now, what's the word just do? Why not this is to say? Why this is just to say? Now, see, all of a sudden we begin to ask some very interesting questions about word choice, don't we, right? In other words, the word justice means to defend, right? Or the word just can mean simple. It's just a dumb plum, simple plum, right? In other words, silly, not that important, kind of off the cuff. In other words, I don't have to explain, but I will explain. Now the poem itself, let's exegete, shall we? Line, uh, level one. I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox. Simple, very simple, right? I've eaten the plums that were in the icebox. But then line five makes this poem a little more interesting. In which you were probably saving for breakfast. And all of a sudden we realize this poem is addressed to someone. Right? Which someone? Someone maybe who this speaker lives with or knows closely. Let's ask this question really quickly, because we didn't ask it in Red Wheelbarrow. What is the tone of voice here? What is the tone of voice? And what do we mean by that? Well, if you say, your mom goes, where do you think you're going, young lady? And you say, where do you think? And she says, don't you use that tone of voice with me. What does that mean? Not what you're saying as much as 
the inflection of how you say it, right? So as we look at this little note poem, right, what is the tone? Do you see it as serious? Mm, normally, no, right? Do you see it as kind of comic or half-hearted? Some will say, yeah. You kind of get the sense that these are two people who maybe know each other well. So there's maybe a bit of banter or joking going back and forth, right? You are probably, the word probably here, raises the possibility that he's wrong, but probably knows that he or she is right. Saving for breakfast. Whoops. The second part is fascinating. Forgive me. Right? They, the plums, were delicious. <laughs> so in other words, do you get a sense that the person who wrote this poem feels really bad about what he or she has done? Not at all, right? I ate your plums, and by the way, really good. I'm going to ask for your forgiveness, but quite frankly, I could care less whether you give it to me or not. Why? Because the plums are, first line of the poem, already eaten. In other words, I've already done it. This is not to explain to you that I can undo it. This is to explain to you that I have done it. We might say it this way, deal with it, right? Deal with it. I ate your plums, big deal. But then to finish, he says about the plums, not only they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. Hmm. And immediately, of course, we've got to play games here with this word so, just like this word just. The simple language of, uh, of this poem that leaves the reader with, are you ready for this? An image. Let's write it down at level one. What is the image that immediately is captured in this poem for you? What is that image for you? Write it down really quickly at, at uh, level one. Some students will say the first thing they see is what this picture here in the book shows you. Beautiful plums. Cold, sweet, right? Other students will say they actually see like a scribbled note stuck on an ice box or a refrigerator door or left on the kitchen table, right? This is just to say, right? Some students will say about the image of this poem that there is a grinning person who is writing the note and the real question is, do you sign it or do you not sign it after you finish when you say, uh, ate your plums, not sorry about it, but I am, I, I, I am going to say forgive me, right? The humor, of course, of the poem works well. Finally, of course, we said that images poetry is going to elicit all kinds of senses. What are the senses here? What can you see? Of course, taste comes immediately to mind here, doesn't it, right? Can you hear a little chuckle behind the speaker as the speaker goes, uh, about those plums you were going to probably eat for breakfast. Whoops, sorry. Man, they were good, though. Right? Of course, we can ask at level three some very interesting kind of comparative questions at 3A. For example, of the two poems, Red Wheelbarrow, and this is just to say, which one are you more attracted to and why? How are they similar poems? How are they different poems? Again, we could go back to Ezra Pound's A Few Don'ts and ask, is this a work of imagery, an imagist offering, as Ezra Pound defines it in his essay, A Few Don'ts? Finally, let's go to 3B really quickly in a personal reference to this poem. For you personally, do you find that this poem has a certain kind of tone that matches anything you've ever done in your life? Where you played a joke on somebody or you did something and you basically said, sorry, forgive me, and you kind of understood it's already forgiven before you even ask. Of course, the reality is, does the speaker of this poem ask for forgiveness? Do you get a sense that the speaker of this poem actually asked for forgiveness? No, you don't really get a sense. That's the whole point of the title. This is just to say. In other words, I ain't really asking for forgiveness. I'm just telling you this is what I've done. But there seems to be a certain kind of ingenious tone to this poem that shares a whole world of possible experiences with this person, which begs a really interesting 3D question. Do you have one person in your life that you could play a game like this with? 
In other words, you know that you could do something like this and the person would just start dying laughing at the note. They wouldn't be mad. They wouldn't be mad, right? Of course, we can finally ask this question. In your own biography, if you were to ever have to write a note that says, this is just to say I did X, what would that be for you? One of my students once reporting that he walked out of school and he didn't have his vehicle and he looked at his friend's truck and his friend's truck had the keys in it and so he just jumped in it and drove it home. And he says, I would have left a note that said, this is just to say, I drove your truck home. Hope you enjoy the walk. Forgive me. But he knew the friend so well that he knew that the friend would just laugh about it and say, you know, take out his phone and say, dude, come pick me up. What are you, what are you doing? You know, that kind of thing, right? Let's look at the third of the William Carlos Williams poems, The Great Figure. I'm with you now on page 724. The Great Figure. This is a fascinating little poem. Uh, you will be amazed at the range of William Carlos Williams if you decide to Google him. And hey guys, I should say this out loud. This is the whole point of a class like the one we're doing. If you read one poem by Ezra Pound that you kind of think is interesting, I hope that you go online, Google, and read a bunch of his poems, especially his poems that are translated. Uh, he translates out of the Chinese language. It's amazing poetry. And I would hope the same is true of William Carlos Williams, that you would enjoy these three poems enough that you might take out your phone at some point and say, I wonder what are some of his other poems? Does he, does he play this game with all of his poems? The Great Figure. Let's read it together. I'm on 724. Among the rain and lights, I saw the figure five in gold on a red fire truck, moving, tense, unheeded to gong clangs, siren howls, and wheels rumbling through the dark city. Now let's just pause at level one. Now that you've played this game already with two of his offerings, you ought to be able to play this game now pretty, pretty well. Let, at level one, just summarize what it is that the image is. Okay? That the image is. Number two. Form at 2B. Uh-oh, let's point out how this poem looks structurally different from the other two poems. What for you is the major difference? Some students will point out this one has a more traditional first letter capitalized last punctuation mark period. Some students have pointed out this one doesn't have any stanza breaks. Some students have pointed out that much like Red Wheelbarrow, this is a single sentence that's broken up to create a poem. Let's ask another to be question. Notice the first word, among. Among the rain and lights. Okay. In other words, there is something going on outside. Whoever is seeing this image, and notice this speaker will inject himself, herself, right into the poem. I saw the figure five. Okay? So, what about setting? Jot that one down. By the end of the poem, we're kind of told where we are. The dark city. So the speaker of this poem is in the city at night, walking out or driving out in the rain and the lights, and all of a sudden sees a figure. Now, let's concentrate on the word figure for just a moment, because it's fascinating. When we hear the word figure, as in the great figure, what came to your mind right away? Many readers will say their first thought is figure as in the shape of a body. Dude, you have a great figure means you have a great body. Other students will say they thought great figure meant great person. In fact, we had this phrase, although we don't use it as much. William Carlos Williams was playing a game here, ironically, because it was a phrase that was often used 
in the great man hypothesis, that is great leaders, and often those great leaders were called great figures of history. What game is William Carlos Williams playing with the word figure? What game? Go ahead and write that down. What game is he playing here? He has led you to believe that figure is the, the, the way you look in your body, or a great person, the great figure, when in fact figure here means what? Right, a number, a number, right? But notice for William Carlos Williams, or the speaker of the poem, it isn't really about the figure. By the way, do notice that the adjective great is not used at line three. Instead he says, I saw the figure five in gold on a red fire truck. So in other words, immediately, here it is, the image. Oh, he's driving or walking in the rain, nighttime in the city, all the sounds and everything, and then all of a sudden, there it is, a big what? Fire truck, right? Right there's a big fire truck. When he looks at the fire truck, the first thing that he focuses on, the speaker focuses on, he or she, is the number five. Right there probably on the side of the fire truck, right? Okay. But then the poem starts to make some very interesting kinds of suggestions. About the red fire truck, he says several things. Notice the line breaks. Moving, meaning what? Is the fire truck sitting still? No, so it's going past him or her, right? Tense. Whoa, now that's an interesting word. Tense. Now, if we speak about grammar in tense, we're talking about past, present, future. But here, the use of the word tense means what? What does that mean, tense? If somebody appears tense to you, what does that mean? Right, right. Agitated, uncertain, worried, right? Why would, jot it down, why would a, 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 a fire truck hurrying somewhere with its siren going lead to anyone being tense? Why do you think? Yeah, it's like, oh no, what's going on? Any time that those kinds of situations happen, usually it's because something bad has, is transpiring, right? Notice unheeded. What does that mean? Unheeded. The fire truck is moving. Tense. Unheeded to gong clangs, siren howls, and wheels rumbling through the dark street. What is unheeded? Well, this now will take us back to the very title itself, the great figure. In other words, the city will only momentarily pause, right, for even a fire truck going somewhere. Why? Because it's the nature of the city, right? It is the nature of the hustle and the bustle of city, right? Yeah, right, somebody's off they go, right, unheeded, on to the next project, right? Gong clangs elicits that sense of sound, right? Siren howls, wheels rumbling, through the dark city. In other words, this is a poem that gives you an image of the cacophony of the city, the complexity of life in the city in the night, right? Where all this stuff is happening and only one of those things is, again, right, the, the, the fire truck going somewhere, right? Let's jump to level three really quickly. In terms of comparing this to the other two titles, Jot down how this poem is similar, how this poem is different. Of course, you can also at 3a ask this question, how does this poem relate to what Ezra Pound said great images poetry does in his essay, A Few Domes? And finally, at 3b, what's a personal way for you to respond to a title like this? Some students will make the observation that this is a powerful single image where he concentrates on a little tiny part of the big part. Do you got me? The little five on the side of the fire truck is what he first sees, and then he sees the rest of the fire truck, and then all of the stuff surrounding it. 
Which begs a really interesting question for you. Do you have a tendency to ever do this? For example, when you look at people, do you have a tendency to look at one thing? What it is, for example, maybe that they're wearing. So what, for example, one of my students recently said, you know, I find that I do this when I go to the mall. Like when I'm at the mall and I'm walking around, I'm, I, I, I always look at people, and one of the first things that I look at is to see what kind of phone cover they have. Right? So the, everybody's got their phone, right? What's the phone cover? Like, what, what does that look like, right? So they got their phone out, you know. Why? Because your phone cover says something about you. Have you noticed how few students have just their phone anymore? Have you noticed this? They, they usually will have some kind of a cover. Well, what does it mean if they don't have a phone cover? It says something interesting about them, right? Well, my students seem to think so. And then from the observation of the phone could make then a general observation about everything else. In other words, what is a situation where you work from the specific to the general, right? From the little to the big, okay? Of course, this is a very interesting personal question. When you look at yourself in a mirror, what do you look at first? That is a very interesting question. Because most of the time, we do not look at our full self in the mirror first, but rather we look specifically at just one thing. What is that for you when you're looking at yourself or a person who you care very much about? If you have a lover, for example, think about this the next time that you see him or her. What do I look at first? The very first thing I look at. Is it the same every time? Hmm. Or is it different? Yeah. Maybe for some of us, the eyes, right? Beautiful. The irony, of course, of the title is The Great Figure, which really is a, a kind of, again, again, it's kind of hyperbole, it's kind of an exaggeration. There's nothing great about this poem, as in large, but maybe there is, because it is the little things that make the big things necessary. Of course, we could say at 3A, that's similar. 